Kia ora. I'm Associate Professor Tony Hickey and I work at the School of Biological Sciences and I'm here to convince you to uh, think about doing a degree with us in Biological Sciences. My specialty is that I actually work on different species of animals. I'm a comparative physiologist or ecophysiologist and I study how different organisms have adapted to their environments. Here's an example, a New Zealand triple fin fish, an endemic species, and uh, they've adapted to all sorts of different environments of high, low oxygen, high temperatures, low temperatures, um, and extremes of depth. However, I also have turned my trade to explore things such as heart function in different conditions with high temperature, low temperature, but also diabetes and hypertension and so forth. So I have a broad range of skills and a large interest in biology. However, I'm not really here to talk to you about me. I'm here to talk to you about what you might want to do. And it's kind of hard to do this, so I sort of thought, what could I do? So I'm going to give you a bit of a, a teaser of a lecture, and I'm going to talk about the beginnings of life, because I also teach biochemistry, and if you take biological sciences, you'll probably get me teaching you in Biology 101. So, life. I was led to believe that life started off uh, with nucleic acids and so forth. This is how our lecture started. But no one really explained to me how life could have started from the very beginning. So I'm going to do that now. So about 14 billion years ago, something happened. And it was a very, very powerful bang. And this bang set off in motion the molecules that we are now made of. As matter coalesced and formed things, we ended up with stars and stars started to produce the elements that you are composed of. And yes, indeed, you are a star, but don't get too excited because you're actually quite common. You've made a very common stuff such as carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur and things like that. But life is more complex than just these elements and life needs molecules and these molecules how did they come to be so a really cool cool guy Stanley Miller back in 1952 did an experiment with a whole lot of glassware where he bubbled and boiled some ammonia and hydrogen and methane together in, in some water and he left it for seven days and at the end of these seven days he had the building blocks of life some simple amino acids and this was quite a cool experiment but one of the things here is is he used electricity, a spark, to actually generate uh, uh, the energy that, that powered life. And we can see it here with his little gizmo. So life needs energy and to actually capture and harness that energy. So how did we get this energy? Well, it's thought that it could have come from the sun, it could have come from hydrothermal vents. I've got a really weird perspective put on this, is electrical energy. Now remember that Stan used electricity to do this. So where can electrical energy come from? It's a bit sporadic to think it comes from lightning strikes because that's not going to be continuous. But there's another option. There is a thing called the earth current. So as the earth spins in space, it has an iron core and it's spinning away, the sun belts down on it uh, solar wind and the solar wind has an interaction with the earth. As the solar wind pours over the earth it starts to draw ions out of the earth and so effect we start to get a current and as this current flows to the earth this can do things, it can do, do actual work. So if we zoom in into the crust of the earth and we look what we have, we have within the crust we have elements such as sulfur and iron and there's an abundance of these things and they're quite reactive. They can also team up to form what we call iron sulfur complexes and they build up and build up and they can form wires and these wires can conduct electrons and we know that ions can flow through the earth so possibly, quite possibly, this could be how it's happened but we have to have order and arrangement. Clay or mud and so forth, these can orientate um, the iron and sulfur molecules and the electrons can flow from A to B in a direction. However, what we really need is we need to be able to capture that energy and do something with it. And it just so happens that in space and even from reactions such as Stanley Miller uh, showed in Ure, so iron sulfur complexes are arranged within the clays. Other molecules would have been present at the time too, the simple uh, hydrocarbons. And some of these can form aromatic rings and these can accept and release electrons. So if this aromatic compound moved towards the iron sulfur um, complexes and electrons flow towards it, it makes it overall negatively charged and hydrogens will flow to it. And now we've actually trapped electrons within a molecule. Now you're saying, Tony, this just sounds fanciful. But is it really? Because if we look at some of the enzymes that are present inside your cells, in particular within your mitochondria at complex one, 
we find iron sulfur complexes. And these iron sulfur complexes, they carry electrons from one place to another to a quinone. Even more so, bacteria today living in the scum and ooze will actually transfer electrons from the deep anoxic depths to the surface where there's oxygen. So there's evidence that this sort of uh, mechanism um, can persist. Now that's your biochemistry lecture, but let's think about School of Biological Sciences. So at our School of Biological Sciences, we are a really diverse bunch. We have three sorts of areas. One is on sort of biochemistry and metabolism and physiology. We have people working in ecology and evolution in another area, and we have people working in genetics and so forth as well. So New Zealand is a great place to actually study biology. It's had its own unique exp experiment conducted on it where life has evolved into many different lineages with our birds and our fish. And some examples too, we have here, we have our reptiles, the tuatara, our hihis and our insects such as giraffe weevils, and we are the center of seabird life for the world. So it's an interesting place to actually work. We have people that work and plant ecology and physiology and do some great field trips as well if you're interested in taking up ecology. Um, people working on some of the biggest organisms such as our kauri, people working on our biosecurity and protecting this valuable resource we have, Iron, island conservation through trying to preserve from rats and possums and so forth, urban ecology to deal with more modern issues such as lights at night time, and we have people working on the physiology of our seabirds. We also have people working on the behaviour of our animals and the genetics and how they're related and how they've come to be and evolved in New Zealand. Because we're surrounded by ocean, we have very strong in marine biology and we work in conjunction with the Institute of Marine Sciences and we work from everything from gut microbiota in, say, butterfish to echinoderms and how they deal with climate change up to megafauna such as whales and how their genetics track their survival and their uh, reconstruction of populations over time. We then have molecular and cellular biology and here we've got an example with Professor Russell Snell who works on cattle and he's even developed models for exploring neurodegenerative diseases using sheep. We have people that are working in the fields of cancer and neurodegeneration and also in physiology in terms of shock and sepsis. We have people that work in plant biology, looking at hormone regulation of plants and communication between bacteria in the soil all the way through to the tips of the leaves of trees and flowering signals. And then we have microbiologists and people that work on microbial ecology to explore how environments change with and without pollution or with climate change or other environmental aspects. And then we have structural biologists when we get down to the real nitty gritty of life. People that are exploring how enzymes work right down to the mechanisms of how they make reactions occur and also building cunning little structures to make molecular factories. And then at the tip of it all we have people that are working on computational and evolutionary biology to better understand how all these molecules can interact and how things have evolved. And one particular person here to point out is our head of school, Professor Ellen Rodrigo. So where do our biology students go? There's all sorts of positions. People pick up technical positions or academic positions all around the world. People also step into applied technology. And here we have an example of a company that has developed a skin product. We have people that work in our primary industries, environmental protection authorities and Department of Conservation. People can move into patent or commercial law and also school and teaching about biological sciences in the world around us. Futures, we have some examples of students that have gone on to work for Fonterra and then become carbon traders. A previous student of mine is now a postdoc in South Africa and now has a recent position in Australia. Dr Zoe Hilton, another student of mine, is a senior research scientist at Cawthron investigating how to better make food. And Dr Fatima Iftikhar, my first ever PhD student, is now Director of Terrestrial Science with the Department of Conservation. So there are all sorts of things you can do. People have moved into Scotland Yard. They've also made documentaries. So think about it, you could become the next David Attenborough. And we also have policy advisors to the Beehive. Don't believe me? Well, look at this. So Juliet Girard is one of ours, and here she is with our Prime Minister. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you consider biological sciences and maybe we'll see you there on your journey.